Hello, Fantastic Beast fans. Recently, the film has released some new images to excite us for the upcoming trailer at Comic-Con. Could some of these pictures shed some light on some prior theories we've been discussing? I'm Susan Chappelle with Fantastic Secrets Behind Fantastic Beasts to bring you the clues. Join me and other Fantastic Beast fans here on the Beast Chaser Forum as we uncover the secrets, discover what's coming first, and play along with Rowling's newest game. And make sure you hit the subscribe button, as well as the bell notification, so you'll be notified when videos post and won't miss out on the next clues. Several days ago, the cover for an upcoming film book for Crimes of Grindelwald was released, The Archive of Magic by Signe Bergstrom, with a forward by Jude Law, and including the incredible artwork of Mina Lima. Many of you remembered a prior image this is based on. Back in December, we saw Newt and Tina on the Empire magazine cover, apparently startled in front of a vault. But whose vault is it? And why does it now deserve the front cover treatment of a book that explores all the secret details of the film that in the first movie took on the shape of Newt's case? Obviously, this is something central to FB2 that needs to be further explored. The first thing that caught my interest was the scroll work down the left side. Just decoration, right? Well, since my video on the gen, where I was seeing faces and all the smoke in the trailer, I'm now seeing faces everywhere, and especially here. After analyzing Mina Lima's hidden dragon on the cover of the screenplay, this top image jumped out at me. Do you see the similarity? Then I thought I saw a putty cat a little down lower. Notice the cat-like ears, eyes, and whiskered nose. Also interesting, since we were just discussing wampus cats appearing in the CinemaCon trailer a while back. And because of recent comments from Waldoz and Suvi Holm and Bravo Photography discussing in theory and their likely appearance, I thought maybe this was one here. I'm not quite sure what Inferior would look like in this film. They were kind of skeletal, or Lord of the Rings Gollum-like in Half-Blood Prince. Or could it be a djinn or demon? And then finally, there's this bug-eyed face. Could it relate to the Obscurus? Or perhaps another recently released image that we'll discuss further down. Do you see anything I'm missing? And another what do you think? From its handle at the top to its pointy end, is this a wand down the center? The elder wand, perhaps? But why would these beasts or beings be hidden in the cover design? Here's my theory. Remember back to last video when we discussed that Grindelwald was Newt's shadow, much as Voldemort was to Harry? Is this vault the thematic opposite of Newt's case? The first film was all about the magical creatures Newt kept protected in his case. What if the huge core of what's to come in the crimes of Grindelwald revolves around the beasts and beings that he is recruiting and exploiting for his crimes? These beings hidden on the cover may not only be what we'll find inside the film book, but inside somehow that vault as well. In a video from over a year ago, I showed how symbols on the floor at the pentagram office at Macusa may be sigils used in ceremonial magic, like in a Renaissance grimoire, the Lesser Key of Solomon, that detailed how to use the protection of the pentagram to call forth demons to do the wizard's bidding. This is all based on a legend related to the ancient King Solomon, that he captured 72 jinn and imprisoned them in a brass vessel in order to build his magnificent temple. Did you notice that the vault and the cover seem to be metal, metal laminate? A brass-like metal. Could this brass-plated vault be where Grindelwald contains his magical armory? We saw clearly his interest for obtaining and exploiting the Obscurial. Also, Dumbledore noted in Deathly Hallows that even as a teen, Grindelwald was already interested in building an army of Inferi. So he's had quite a bit of time, and the magical power, to be experimenting and accumulating the weapons he'll need to take over the Muggle world. And as he travels around, he'd need a safe place to stockpile them. Realistically speaking, however, what would the vault hold? Would it be expanding space like Newt's case, 
capable of holding several beasts or beings? Or, as we saw an orb in the stage scene, could it hold orbs or vials of memories? Or is it a portal through space or time transporting the beings to him? However, Universe Harry Potter, a French fan site, threw a monkey wrench into my theory the other day when they showed that the Spanish translation for this same book is titled The Escritorio de Dumbledore. They translated Escritorio as Dumbledore's office, but it could also be a large desk. Either way, it pairs with Jude Law doing the forward for the film book and brings us back to something I've been pondering quite a bit since that first trailer was released. Why is Dumbledore in the defense against the dark arts classroom, leaning ever so casually on his desk? Was he teaching it instead of transfigurations at this time? It seems that a new image released today also hints at this possibility, as Dumbledore, like Lupin later, teaches young Newt in class about Bogarts in the same room. However, most people believe that Galatea Marythought was the DADA teacher during this time period until 1945, but the quote specifically cited only says that she taught at Hogwarts for 50 years, not that she always taught DADA. Defense Against the Dark Arts, it was being taught at the time by an old professor by the name of Galatee Marythought, who had been at Hogwarts for nearly 50 years. Don't you think it seems a bit odd that nowhere in this quote does Dumbledore say, my old DADA professor. She could have taught another subject earlier, or if not, teachers of 50 years occasionally need substitutes, perhaps for a pregnancy or a different extended medical leave. Wouldn't it be natural to call on another professor equally skilled at defense? The Rolling Library also came to the same conclusion and has an excellent article on the subject, which I've linked to in the description below. I think Dumbledore is linked to DADA for now rather than Transfiguration for a couple of reasons. One, because it's more fitting with the story. Defense against the dark arts will grow increasingly important as Grindelwald controls more and more of the wizarding world. And two, it sets Dumbledore up for a huge fall. The fact that the DADA teacher, even if a substitute, sent a former student to face Grindelwald and didn't confront him himself until it was well past time, has to be another item of shame, as Luca Schlitt so excellently points out in a comment from over a month ago. In the end, I think this shame will build to an intense fire inside Dumbledore, eventually propelling him to that final showdown with his former lover. If Dumbledore was covering DADA, as well as Transfigurations, for an extended time, that would give him long enough to leave his mark on this classroom. We saw before how his office hid his secrets, vials of collected memories, and the pen seed. And I think if we look carefully, we can see some secrets here in his DADA class as well. Look here, and here, and here. These are zodiac spears, and astrolabes, and armillary spears, all implements of tracking the cosmos and time. This one in particular intrigues me the most. I've been researching it ever since the trailer released and think it is based on a Renaissance turret clock, except Dumbledore's has an added layer of meaning. All these designs to me hint at the music of the spheres, which is a complex Pythagorean concept, but simply put believes that the cosmos are in harmony and that the heavenly bodies the planets, moons, sun, and stars are aligned to be musically in tune with each other. It's a tantalizing link of music interwoven with time, a very appropriate music box for a man who said, ah, music, a magic beyond all we do here. I imagine that Dumbledore's music box is an automaton that turns and chimes as it keeps time. Obviously, something is up with time in Dumbledore. I've already done a couple of videos on time, starting with the loss of a week in the newspapers in New York City. And remember the video when I theorized that the thing on the floor of the postcard scene was a pocket watch? Since then, I've wondered if it was not a pocket watch, but rather an astrolabe or even a 1920s time turner. 
But the biggest Tom Clues with Dumbledore were found over three months ago by one of this blog's followers, the extremely sharp-eyed Francisco Kilo Kilo. Shortly after the first trailer release, Francisco tweeted me that he'd found a big clue. The time on the clock on top of St. Paul's, 7.30, is precisely the time Hermione and Harry return to in Prisoner of Azkaban to save Sirius and Buckbeak. Note, this is the time in the movie, not in the book. But not only that, Francisco also caught in a featurette before the release of the first film this very Hoovian reference back to Prisoner of Azkaban. Mysterious thing, time. Time is a huge hint, and it seems Dumbledore may be the biggest hintee. So why all these time hints surrounding Dumbledore? I think first, there's a very personal reason. We know from Deathly Hallows that Dumbledore's greatest fear and biggest regret was facing what happened that day his sister was killed. He's much closer to Ariana's death in 1927 than 70 years later. Do you think that the man who was so tempted later in life to put on a cursed ring in order to see his family and apologize would not have been tempted as an even younger man to experiment with or manipulate time in the hopes of restoring his sister to who she may have been? or at least salving his own conscience. I'm guessing Dumbledore started out researching time because of his shame over Ariana and to try to answer the driving questions that plagued him. However, along the way, perhaps something else happened. He found a way to track what Grindelwald was up to with his experiments, and he's been keeping tabs on him ever since. As Dumbledore collected vials of memory later, when tracking Tom Riddle's movements across Europe, could he have done something similar earlier with Grindelwald, but perhaps with a different method? I'm wondering if this possible automaton music clock will one day open to reveal a treasure trove of secrets. If Dumbledore was manipulating time back in the 1920s, perhaps that's why he had the experience to tell Harry and Hermione years later that they must not be seen. Perhaps we'll even see him get caught at it. And thinking about Prisoner of Azkaban, I've got one more idea about something or someone that may be hiding in the DADA classroom. Remember how after Hermione and Harry returned to the present time and Snape was so incensed Sirius had disappeared and suggested Harry was behind it, Dumbledore said to Snape, Unless you were suggesting that Harry and Hermione are able to be in two places at once, I'm afraid I don't see any point in troubling them further. This quote showed us something crucial about Dumbledore's character, how he was able to state the absolute truth, but in such a way as to make it seem ridiculous, except to the people in the know. Now, watch this bit in the trailer and listen to what Dumbledore said. If you'd ever had the pleasure to teach him, you'd know Newt is not a great follower of orders. Newt doesn't follow orders well. And notice that look off to the right side. Now, look at these books stacked on the front of Dumbledore's desk. And then notice this quill placed carefully alongside, though no parchment is in sight. And now, look back to the first original covers for Newt's Fantastic Beast textbook. What if Newt has not left the country yet because he does not take Dumbledore's orders very well? What if he had questions? I may be way off here, but wouldn't it be funny if Newt were right in the office at this very moment listening in? What if the, frit what if the ministry almost caught him in the act of signing books for Dumbledore's students who just left? Newt has a ready-made hiding place in his briefcase which would not look out of place in a classroom. But is it there? Perhaps it's hard to see with the chairs and desk all pushed to the side, masking it. But with Dumbledore's last glance off to the right, I'm wondering if he's taunting Newt, hiding right under here or behind there. And this brings us back to Newt's case and another new image released a few days ago from Empire Magazine. Thanks to artist Ross Nicholson, 
who caught it first and posted it online for us all to enjoy. And thanks to Universe Harry Potter, who showed the link between this new image and one released earlier at the HP celebrations in January. It definitely seems to be the same setting. And as Jacob is wet here, and also in the scene in Newt's home or office, which also has a brick wall, I'm assuming that's where he is. In fact, with the two scenes side by side, I wonder if Jacob just popped out of Newt's case. I had an earlier theory that Newt was somehow using it as a port key. We know Newt is adept at manipulating space. Perhaps he's even improved his skills a bit and linked up his and Jacob's trunks. One more thought on Jacob's drenched state. Look at this clip from an exclusive revealed today on Sky Cinema UK. Notice how Queenie is standing in pouring rain, looking after someone, before quickly glancing behind her to someone who suddenly appears. Watch it again. Could Jacob have been with Queenie before being ported out? So let's see. We've got Newt manipulating space, Dumbledore manipulating time, and Grindelwald manipulating beasts and beings, matter. Is Rowling playing with physics here? And why? Let me assure you that I'm no physicist, so forgive me if I don't get things quite right, but I'm wondering if these hints at time, space, and matter manipulation are a nod back to the potent energy of the Obscurus as a weapon of mass destruction, an atomic bomb that we explored in a prior video a year ago. Could we meet a magical Einstein or Oppenheimer in the course of the film, or have we already? But speaking of weapons of mass destruction, I want to go back to the most curious part of that image in Empire magazine. Just what are those helmets and coats hanging on Newt's back wall? I had a hunch and went looking for images of chemical warfare protection from the early part of the 20th century. To me, there's a striking resemblance. However, I don't think we'll see chemical warfare as such. What's much more likely to happen is that Rowling will use a beastly substitute, and there just so happens to be a hint of it in that same Empire image. Inside Newt's case is a picture of what looks like a streeler a creature that is also featured on the magical Zodiac, who leaves a venom trail so deadly it burns everything in its path. Newt must have that protective gear about as he's caring for and studying the Streeler. He wouldn't be devising a chemical weapon. However, we've seen him use swooping evil defensively. I've said before, somewhere down the line, Newt is going to face some tough decisions about how he's using his magical beast, and will his protections be enough to keep them out of Grindelwald's control? It's interesting to me that Rowling links these three men through manipulation of the primary elements of physics, but for very different reasons. Dumbledore probably wishes to alter time out of shame and regret. Grindelwald, however, in his obsession to build power and realign his world, is altering matter. And Newt, he expands space due to his desire to save, kind of like Harry. Which brings up another interesting correspondence. Harry used the invisibility cloak to envelop and hide his friends. Newt does the same with his case. And as Dumbledore wore the resurrection stone to see his family again, he may now be manipulating time for the same reason. Rindelwald seeks power, whether through a magical being or the Elder Wand. So our final equation looks like this. Space equals invisibility cloak equals Newt. Time is the resurrection stone equals Dumbledore. Mass as transformed by the Elder Wand equals Grindelwald. When all these magical powers combine, I believe the end result will be a fusion of energy. Credence as we see hinted at in this image. And before you think the story is all about the men, let me assure you that the ladies, plus Jacob, have their counterbalance, but that will be in the follow-up video.
The one aspect that bothers me in this whole theory is the question of who exactly owns the vault. Is it Dumbledore's record archive of Grindelwald's crimes or Grindelwald's safety deposit box for his experiments? It's easier to imagine Tina and Newt sneaking into something that belongs to Grindelwald, but that may be the exact reason why Rowling twisted it and has them spying on Dumbledore instead. After all, loyalties are to be divided in this film. What I'm fairly sure of, however, is that Grindelwald is amassing an armory and Dumbledore the record of it. So what do you think? Could Dumbledore be playing with time? And if so, in what way? Please share your thoughts in the comments. Also, please check out my new fan shop on Amazon for all things Fantastic Beast, including the upcoming film book, The Archive of Magic, mentioned in this video. And be sure to hurry back here as soon as we get the next trailer. Until next time.